Welcome to Taste Buds. I'm Deborah Eckerling, goal strategist, writer, and foodie. And today I'm speaking with Katie Workman, who's founder of the Mom 100 website and author of the Mom 100 cookbook and Dinner Solved. And she's also a food writer for the Associated Press. So you are like easy recipes 101 mom person, pretty much, Kitty. Yes, definitely easy recipes, definitely um, um, sort of very accessible recipes. And as we will talk about more, very comfort food oriented recipes. And when I first started writing my cookbooks and started the blog, it was uh, very focused on being a mom and having two young boys in the house. And as the years have gone by and my boys are not so young and um, the cooking has gotten sort of a little bit more general in, in terms of sort of who it's for. Where did that love of food and cooking come from? That came from kind of every place that it could come from. Um, my mom was a great cook. Um, my sister and I grew up cooking in our house. We love food. We love uh, entertaining. And, um, and my father was a cookbook publisher. Uh, well, he was a book publisher and published a lot of cookbooks. And I spent my childhood re reading cookbooks as the way people read other books. And so it was sort of just intrinsically absorbed throughout many, many years. So you are like the result of nature and nurture? Yes, that's a very good way to put it. It's funny. I actually just had that conversation with somebody recently about how I pretty much think everything is somewhat of a balance between nature and nurture. And in this case, it would be probably hard to, to separate the two. And so do you remember your earliest food memory? My earliest food memory, well, the earliest I remember, I mean, I grew up making Toll House cookies constantly. I made biscuit coffee cakes like every Sunday until my family pretty much begged me to stop because how many <laughs> coffee cakes can one family eat? Um, and I, I, when I was 12, I got a pasta machine for my birthday, a hand crank, you know, pasta machine. And I used to make pasta all the time. Um, and just, it was, there was always, and you know, when you have to dry pasta, you sort of hang it over things. So it was just always like pasta hanging over the back of chairs in our house and everything like that. There was always, there was always strands of pasta, like in weird lurky places. So what you're saying is if MasterChef Junior were a thing when you were growing <laughs> up, you would have like won. I would have, I, I don't know if I would have had the courage to compete, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but that's never been my thing. But, uh, but yes, it was, I was one of, I was one of those kid cooks before kid cooks sort of felt like they were proliferating and taking over the world. Awesome. And so uh, how, how did you go from someone who read cookbooks for fun and over postured your family to website, um, founder and cookbook author, et cetera. Where, how'd we go from one to the next? Well, I, when I graduated college, I went into book publishing as well. And I became an assistant editor to a cookbook editor who's still one of my closest friends to this day. And nice. so I was, I became a cookbook editor. So I did that for many years. And then I kept going in publishing and sort of was moving my way up the publishing ladder. And um, and I realized that I was getting farther and farther away from cookbooks and farther away from food, which was really the driving the driving thing for me. I love cooking. I love feeding people and I love writing. And so those things, um, they, they certainly made sense when I was a cookbook editor. And then when I left book publishing, I became the founding editor in chief of a website that no longer exists. Um, but it was a recipe based website and it was, um, I know an incredible learning experience. It was, it was very bumpy. It was a startup, you know, startups are, are you know, hard and we, launched in 2008 and I believe the next day Lehman Brothers went under so it was not a great time for <coughs> excuse me for fundraising but um but I started to understand like what the world of online recipes was all about and then at that time um a friend of mine who was an editor approached me and asked if I was interested in writing a cookbook but she liked the way the way I wrote and I had the idea for the Mom 100 cookbook then, which is 100 recipes every mom needs in her back pocket. And was just sort of an answer to 
<clears throat> the everyday cooking challenges, conundrums that parents face day in, day out when they're cooking for their families. And I started the blog as sort of a companion to the cookbook because, you know, it's this 2012 and blog food blogs were becoming a thing and you needed an online presence of some sort. And then, um, so I wrote the first book and I wrote the second book and I wasn't, the, the website was sort of just um, a support, a supporting cast member in a sense, but then the website started taking off and um, traffic was really good and I was really enjoying it. And then I decided to sort of professionalize the website. So at that point I started working with a professional food photographer, or a, a, several professional food photographers and hired a content manager and started to just, it was sort of a go big or go home moment. I was either going to make the website into something that was going to be a real job or I was going to find something else to do. So it ended up becoming a real job. That's awesome. And and it really is usually you hear the other stories, you know, someone developed a website and then the cookbook yes. came from it. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I live in West LA. So we refer to ourselves as Silicon beach sometimes. So I totally get that era yes, <laughs> that you're yes. talking about for sure. And so you obviously it's this love that you've had your entire life. Uh, how mm -hmm. much of uh, your Jewish upbringing, do you think, has influenced this love of food and cooking? Well, it's, it, I don't know so much that it was the Jewish part of my upbringing that influenced. It certainly has influenced some of the, the recipes that I created. Um, and some of the ones that are the most popular on the site, uh, the noodle kugel I have on the site is a really popular recipe. The Jewish brisket is a really popular recipe. Um, and, you know, I make you know, around Hanukkah, I make enough latkes to, you know, flotillas of latkes for everybody around me. And so there are certain parts of that. And we always, you know, we did have, we were not religious growing up. We did not have a specifically religious Jewish upbringing, but we definitely celebrated the holidays. We I have referred to my family, we're, we're food Jews as much as anything else. We definitely express our Jewishness through cooking and through the um, holiday meals, you know, Passover, Rosh Hashanah, breakfast, and Yom Kippur. So those meals and the foods associated with them are definitely a very, very intrinsic part of my, my childhood. Do you play favorites? <laughs> Do you have with a favorite? Recipes? Your... Yes. Um, latkes. I, I, I mean, if I had to pick a favorite Jewish recipe, I have to, it's gotta be latkes. I, and I make, I, I had a latke party this year, which we often do. And I, I made, uh, 200 latkes, uh, this year. And, um, so. Is that all? <laughs> is that all? <laughs> yeah. 200 latkes. And, and there was only like three or four left. And and this is the other part of me that's Jewish, which is like, thank God there was some left because if I had actually run out of food, I would have like, I, I that would have been devastating. <laughs> you can't run out, cannot. No, you have to have enough to feed an army and then yes. another army. And then another army because you don't know if there's another army that might come in and be hungry and need some latkes. So you have to, you have to have too much. Well, we definitely love food and probably the thing that we love more than food is sharing food, which you illustrated so absolutely beautifully. Do you have a favorite go-to recipe that's any category? <laughs> any category. Well, um, I would say that the there's some favorites in my house with my, you know, my boys um, and my husband, they love um, this cheesy beefy noodle casserole that I make, which of course has meat and cheese, so it is not kosher. Sorry. And then um, tacos is another huge favorite in our house, and I actually make them often with uh, ground turkey. And that my older son Jack has asked for tacos for every birthday, every special occasion where he gets to suggest the the menu. It has never been anything other than tacos. So, and I make my own taco blends. You know the seasoning blend which I spent an enormous amount of time uh, creating. So um, th then I make it in batches and I just keep it. And then whenever you bring home two pounds of ground, whatever, turkey, beef, chicken, you can make tacos. 
it's so you're like taco ready at any particular moment. I'm taco ready. I am I am absolutely. You I actually have all the makings for tacos, including the ground turkey, in my house at this very moment. I could make, I could have tacos on the table in half an hour. <laughs> okay, and I believe you're going to share that recipe. So if you go to jewishjournal.com slash podcast, not only will you get to read the highlights from this conversation, you too can be taco ready at any moment. You can moment. be taco ready. So what is it about food that that is that great equalizer so my sub my sub ahead is you know food cooking and community because they go hand in hand so mm -hmm. where what's your take well i've been involved in hunger relief my entire life i've been i'm on the board of city harvest which is new york's largest food rescue organization i've been on the board of that for uh, 25 years, I think. And um, I've also been on the leadership council of Share Our Strength, No Kid Hungry, which is a uh, national organization that is working to eradicate childhood hunger in this country. And that the, the sort of the feeding of, of people, whether you know them or not, is just at the core of everything that, that drives me. I just, I, I think that, you know, obviously food is a right. People have, you know, the the ability to know where your next meal is coming from to feed your family nutritious food is a right. And in this country, it 100% should be a right in a country with this much prosperity and this much abundance. And unfortunately, um, about one in five to one in six children in this country is food insecure. And it's a kind of breathtaking number to think of, of how many you know millions of children that is and their families. And so I think that for me, it's, it's, there's sort of, there's the global sharing of food, the, the, the bigger idea that everybody deserves a nutritious, comforting meal on their table and should not wonder where that meal is coming from. And then that translates a hundred percent into my home where, you know, I, I know I shouldn't say this on national radio, but we don't, we don't even lock our door. We just like people just come and go and pull up a chair and there's always plenty and there's always sort of the desire to gather around a table and um, and just food being an equalizer is sort of, that's the, that's the ideal. And, um, and then further to that food being a, a way to understand and learn about other cultures, other people, share your culture. Um, I've just been working on, um, my two recent recipes that I've been working on like a lot is one is Vietnamese spring rolls because um, one of my closest friends' mom is Vietnamese and she made these spring rolls for us years ago. And I decided that I was gonna translate them into a recipe. And it, no matter what culture you are, if a grandmother gives you a recipe, it's probably not gonna be very clear and you have to decipher it and test it and figure out the quantities and what she means by, you know, fold, roll this up or whatever. And um, another one that I've been working on is um, I belong to a Japanese pottery studio and the woman who runs the pottery studio is obviously Japanese. And she she gave me a recipe for takigomi, which is takikomi, which is um, a, a rice dish. And it's like, it's pure comfort food. And even if you've never had it before, even if you never grew up with takikomi, like to have a bite of it, you're like, like you're just like, you feel like you're so soothed and comforted and just like, it's like a little, you know, just, it's just such a warmth to eat it is to look, to feel like, oh, somebody loves me. So, um, I, you know, that's really what that food is like, clearly an expression of love. And um, I had an old friend who actually called me, he always used to call me Katie, food is love workman. That was like what my full name was to him. Um, and it's a cliche, but it's a good one. It's some cliches are, you know, really true and they're there for a reason. And uh, the, the pleasure of sharing food with other people, whether, you know, the pleasure of sharing food with other people is extraordinary and the pleasure of sharing food that you made with other people is even better. Well, and you repeat, I was going to say cliches are cliches for a reason. So I totally mm -hmm. love, that's like the best nickname. If that were my nickname, I would put it <laughs> everywhere. Uh, what is, so every culture then has that comfort food as well. Yeah. And, and so not only food connects us, but comfort food connects us. So yeah. Is, 
So is is tacos the comfort food, or is there another yes. comfort food that you just love more than anything? Well, tacos is probably the comfort food of my family, which is again like kind of funny, right? Like we're this Jewish New York family, and um, you know our comfort food is a Mexican or a Tex-Mex uh, dish. Um, you know, again the cheesy beef. My family really likes just you know it's it's you it's food that doesn't like demand that much of you. You know, like when you're not sort of like oh like you know how did you make this or what, you know, how did you, or like, like, like I can't put my finger on the, the seasonings. I mean, that kind of food is very experiential and delicious. And we go to restaurants or we experiment at home on a weekend and make some like ornate intricate dish. But the food that I make is just, you know, it, it, it's so obvious to say it's food that people want to eat. But like you have a visceral reaction to it, right? Like somebody says like, oh, what are you making? Your chicken pot pie, chicken and dumplings, you know, um, you know, steak and potatoes. It's, it's, you're just, you have a, a sort of a natural longing for it. And I, and it, it doesn't just have to be sort of American, which American food, what world is that? You know, we don't, it's like a very big, you know, a weird big bucket to say. I mean, American food, are, are we talking about? food from, you know, Georgia? Are we talking about food from Maine? Are we talking about food from the Midwest? It's, you know, there's, there's so many different pockets of it all. But um, I, I love food that like the first time that you eat it, you think, oh, where has this been all my life? Oh, there's nothing better than a food awakening, right? Yes. And, and, and you know, there was a series that I was on for a while that um, NPR did that was called Found Recipes. And it was about a recipe that you came across and had a food awakening and you're where has this been all my life kind of thing. And it was, um, I did a, a number of them, but it was food that I had, you know, recipes that I had come across and not intentionally been looking for or researching. It was just something I tasted and then you find out that like, oh, this is a thing, you know, this Atlantic beach pie that I did once, which ended up being this <laughs> actually became this whole national thing. It was a chef in, his name was Bill Smith, and he was a chef um, at a restaurant called Crook's Corner in North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and he made this pie, which is like this lemon custard pie with a saltine crust and these billows of whipped cream on top, and his he grew up eating it. I had never had it in my entire life, but I took a bite of it and was like, you know, it's one of those things you're like, eyes kind of roll back in your head, and you're like, oh. Okay, I'll never be without this again. Well, finding your food soulmate, I can see how that would be really important. <laughs> the the other thing that that you've brought up is your soulmate food doesn't have to be fancy. No. It can just be love. It can just be love. I mean, one of my soulmate foods is Japanese salad dressing, but like and there's several different there's many versions, of course, I mean, there's the creamy more miso-based one and then there's the more chunky carroty ginger ones that are like with a little sesame oil. If I eat a bowl of salad with Japanese salad dressing, that's to me, like I have, I'm like back in the womb, only I'm not because my mother is not Japanese. So. <laughs> well, it is amazing how foods from different cultures can just make you want to be part of it. I mean, and everybody loves Jewish deli food. I mean, I've yeah. done enough of this um del the i've done enough of these conversations and yeah. enough food writing to know and even people who i i mentioned the podcast to anyone who's not jewish and we end up in a food conversation yeah and they share their favorite food so i think we don't own our foods we get to share them which i think mm -hmm. every culture gets yeah yeah that's a really nice way to put it and i will say the jewish comfort food to me like a great bagel with really good smoked salmon, onion, cream cheese, like there is, not, and my whole family feels that way. There's nothing, nothing, nothing like a perfect bagel and salmon situation. You know, you would not be surprised if I tell you how many people have, I think everybody has their perfect bagel. I'm gonna have to mm. on that because we know what kind of bagel we like and what we like on it. Yes. But not only that, like the order. Yeah, 
Yep. And then, you know, do you like it slightly brown? Do you like it crispy? And then there's a whole like, you know, what kind of bagel, right? I mean, for me, it's sesame. Um, that's like a well done sesame bagel, not toasted, but freshly made. That's my bagel. But, you know, and then my son's girlfriend, she, she has an everything bagel with butter, lettuce, cucumber, and salmon. That's, that's her perfect bagel. <laughs> I think we just started a new, new thing and I'm going to have to be asking this question of all of my guests. What is your perfect bagel? It's, so. You should. You should. It's a really good question. My mother-in-law, I, I'm curious to hear your reaction to this. My mother-in-law likes her smoked salmon on a cinnamon raisin bagel. I have no problem with that, but I can understand how it would make other people cringe. Yeah, it's a little, I, yeah, I don't get yeah. it. But I do get the salty sweet thing. So to some degree, it's a little bit of that, right? You've got the salty well, fish and the sweet cinnamon raisin bagel. Well, I feel like with salads, if you put fruit in them, it makes it better. So how is that different? I love fruit and salads. My children do not. And I often have to put the fruit on the side because they'll say things like, this was a perfectly good salad until you added pears. <laughs> They'll learn or they won't, right? They'll learn or they won't. They'll learn it. Right. Exactly. And not everyone likes everything. That's just the reality. And that's but, okay. Yes. But everybody or just about everybody has an opinion about food. And even if they say they don't have an opinion about food, it's an opinion about food. Yes. They have an opinion about food. They might say that something like, I don't have an opinion about food. I eat the same thing for lunch every day. I'm like, so you do have an opinion about food. You really, really like tuna fish or whatever it is. Exactly. Well, I guess when we own our, our food love and we find our food soulmates, all is right with the world. Yes. Yes. It is. It is, you know, a, again, sort of not to be, uh, it, it, it's a comfort that should be available to everybody. And, and, and the, um, and, and it's, I think that, that, you know, it's people's relationship with food is, is, it's very complex sometimes, but, um, you know, it's sort of also very telling, you know, with what, how people sort of, you know, and I, I do not understand, this is definitely a Jewish thing, although other cultures would claim it too, like people who are indifferent to food, like, per so perplexes me. And I also get very perplexed by people who think, who say, oh, I don't know if I had lunch today. I'm like, how do you not know if you had lunch today? How do you not know every single thing that you ate? <laughs> Confuses me. I am so with you on that. So we can be food soulmates yeah. about food soulmates. What yes. do you think, Katie? I think that that sounds like a very fine deal. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, any final food for thought? Any final food for thought? Um, just that I think that everybody should entertain a little bit. And I know that people get very intimidated by entertaining, but even having people over for spaghetti and meatballs, and maybe you use a jarred sauce, and maybe you even use a bottled salad dressing, but the, the warmth of inviting somebody into your home and having them sit down for a meal that you're offering them, um, it's incredibly gratifying in every direction. And I think people should not meet I love to go out as much as the next person, but I think that people shouldn't substitute entertaining at home for going out all the time. I love that. You open your home, you open your table, and it can be anything. Mm -hmm. It's it not about anything. the actual food. It's about sharing the food. Yep. Yep. Exactly right. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Katie Workman. Where can people find you, learn more about you, your cookbooks? Yeah, um, they can find me on themom100.com. And the cookbooks are The Mom 100 Cookbook and Dinner Solved. And they're available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. And, and definitely through my website. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, Katie Workman, for spending time talking about food and soulmates and comfort food and Why not? That's what I, it's what I do all day. <laughs> I love it. But isn't it lovely? <laughs> like nice. I said before, isn't it great when you get to meet your food loving 
food soulmates as well as talking about the soulmates of food. So I so appreciate you taking the time and thank you for tuning in to Taste Buds with Deb. Don't miss an episode. You can subscribe on YouTube and or your favorite podcast platform. And you can go to jewishjournal.com slash podcast to get read the articles and read the recipes that go with each episode. And you can learn more at tastebudswithdeb.com. So set some food entertaining goals. Own the comfort food that you love so much. And just keep enjoying. Until next time, bon appetit. <laughs>